Hey girl, are your healthy habits all over the place or non-existent? Do you wish you could find true food freedom, move your body for joy, and really just talk a little nicer to yourself? If you have tried to have it hack your health, but the strategies you've tried just haven't worked for you in your busy lifestyle, then this podcast is for you. Hey, I'm Emily Nichols, habit and fitness coach, behavior change specialist, and Taco Tuesday enthusiast. (laughs) Hey, I'm here to tell you there is an easier way than what we've been taught about our health and our habits. How do I know? Well, because I've transformed my own life through habit hacking and now my family gets the best of me and I now help my clients do the same. I'm now going to teach you how to create healthy habits and less time guilt-free for all seasons of your life. It's not your fault your habits haven't worked, my friend. We just have to do them differently. So are you ready to feel empowered and transform your habits and life? Then let's do this. You're listening to episode 217 of Habit Hack Your Health. Hey friend, welcome back to the show. I am coming down off of a high from doing the Healthy Habit Reset live last week. Now remember, if you signed up, all of the replays come down tomorrow, which is Tuesday, August 22nd. And friend, this masterclass is available all year round though. I do it live every quarter with you all to answer any questions that you have in real time. But this masterclass teaches you my five-step habit change method. Think of this as like habit strategy 101 to get you started with where to start really with changing your habits and taking care of your health and learning the system in order to pivot your habits when a new season of life comes your way because it will and us as women the first thing that always goes is usually ourselves and our health and my friend you have to put yourself first it's not selfish a lot of times it's necessary okay so everything's linked in the show notes i also unveiled the new ultimate habit tracker like y'all this is a game changer as far as far as taking action with tracking your habits and the whole tracker is available via google sheets or you can download it via excel i'm obsessed with it because There's no other habit tracker like this because it's created with the Atomic Habits for Women system that I teach, how women have to do habits differently. We're not going to be listing 20,000 different healthy habits. Like We're going to be really dialed in (laughs) as far as tracking your habits on this new Ultimate Habit Tracker. So again, that's linked in the show notes. I hope you go grab it. And I've been loving the feedback I'm hearing so far since we launched it last week. And I hear you loud and clear. You want more digital products like this inside of the shop. So we have printables, but we're going to be coming out with more tracking um, sheets like via Google Sheets and Excel over the next few months and into the new year, such as like a basic habit track or a workout tracker, emotional eating, meal prep, a lot of different trackers that are really niche down based on what you need right now. But the ultimate tracker is where it is at. The ultimate habit tracker is where it's at. So that's linked in the show notes. Go grab it now, my friend. So today we're going to be talking about one of the pillars that I focus on in the Healthy Habits Accelerator. This is my signature program where I use my patented, is it patented? I don't know. I'm saying it is. Habit hacking system that I've created based on my own experience by what I have learned working with so many clients through the years as far as we kind of know what we got to do when it comes to taking care of our health, but it's been so overcomplicated because of diet culture mentality. It's one of the steps in the habit, habit hacking system. You know, if we're talking about food freedom in particular, we really have to look at how women and our relationship with food and our hormones and even movement ideals We really look at like what our beliefs have been, but what is the actual data and how women have to do habits differently when it comes to movement and our own food freedom. But diet culture has really taught us to restrict, take away food, make ourselves smaller, work out because it's punishment or work off calories, so on and so forth because of what we ate. And then what's really, I think, a mind trip for all of us is the praise we get, right? We People notice when you become smaller, when you're losing weight, and it feels really good to be praised for that, right? To be like, oh, Emily, look, you've lost so much weight. Oh, you look so good. 
like in your mind that triggers like, oh, I get praise and I look good because of what people are saying, but do you actually feel good and is that sustainable? I mean, let me ask you this. Have you ever dieted, like crash dieted, and then found yourself getting all this praise and then a year later you're back to where you started or maybe in a few pounds heavier because what you were doing, my friend, just was not sustainable. You know, I coach at Orange Theory and I notice I notice our members' body transformations. I notice because I see them (laughs) every week. And I try really hard not to tell someone, hey, girl, you're looking skinny. But if I notice, you know, their body is transforming. I know they're working really hard in class and out of class. And their body composition has changed. I'd rather, I, you'll hear me say a lot, and if you are a member and you've taken a class with me before, you may have heard me tell you this before, but I usually will say, hey girl, I see you working so hard. I'm so proud of you. Or girl, you are looking so fit. You are looking so strong. I am so proud of you. You'll never hear me saying, girl, you're getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. Because that's probably not going to last and that triggers in our mind that being smaller is what we're working towards where it's not, where it's not. Now, friends, I know we are creating healthy habits here and it's not to become a certain size. It is to improve our health, improve a lot of different markers and our health to feel good, to have energy, but also mentally like, like we talk about in this episode, I want you to feel good looking naked too. But there's a process to it where I feel like we can meet in the middle where we're unsubscribing to diet culture, but still creating healthy habits that support us in a variety of ways. There's a fine line to walk. And today we're going to help you meet in the middle between diet culture and creating healthy habits with Nicole Hagen of the Health, Wealth, and Wisdom podcast. You're going to love this conversation. Nicole is so smart. It makes this so simple for us. So Nicole is a nutrition coach and host of the Health, Wealth, and Wisdom podcast. And she's a new mom. She's driven by her own journey of recovering from a years long eating disorder and healing her own relationship with food. Nicole has found her calling to help other women unsubscribe from the toxic diet culture, find food freedom, and reach sustainable fat loss without deprivation, shame, or guilt. Y'all, this is going to break it down and make it so simple, and I hope some light bulbs go off in your head and some aha moments to really see creating healthy habits as training for life and unsubscribing from diet culture where it's just not sustainable. Okay, so a trigger warning, we will be talking a little bit about eating disorders at the beginning of this conversation with Nicole. But friends, like I said, she makes this so simple for you. So, so simple. This is such a great conversation. I know you're going to really relate to it. Make sure you stick around to the end. As always, I'll give you my three biggest takeaways and give you a habit loop on the end of this episode to help you unsubscribe from diet culture while still creating healthy habits in your life. All right, get a pen and paper handy. You're probably going to want to take notes and let's get this conversation going with Nicole Hagen. All right, gang, thank you again so much for tuning in to Self Transformed. I am here with Nicole Hagen of the Health, Wealth, and Wisdom podcast. Nicole, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. I am so excited to chat with you. We got to chat a little bit back on your show, and I love to be able to do podcast swaps like this and just continue to foster relationships and conversations with other podcasters who are passionate about healthy habits as well. So, But the first question I ask every guest is, what comes to mind when you hear the phrase self-transformed? The first thing that I think of, Emily, is rather simple. I think of self-transformed as the process of transforming or maybe reshaping, if we want to use a synonym, oneself, thoughts and behaviors to create a different, more desirable outcome. That's Mm. what I think of. I love that. And I love asking that question because everyone has their own definition, which I think is beautiful. Well, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your story as far as what has led you to what you do today and even more importantly, who you are today? 
I would love to. So today I am a fairly new boy mom. I have a little 10 month old little man who is keeping me on my toes right now. He is always active and we're loving that. Also with dog mom, we have two golden retrievers who hopefully won't feel the need to chime in on our conversation today. (laughs) And I am a habit-based nutrition coach. But to kind of give you a little bit more of the background, I feel like I have to take you back probably 11 or 12 years ago. At that time, you could have found me counting and burning calories like it was my job. And at that time, it was not because I wrongly believed that the size of my body and my worth were correlated. I was significantly underfed. I was overtrained and I had a terrible relationship with food. I refused to eat out. I logged everything I ate in my fitness pal, including things like vitamins and chewing gum. I even like snuck out of my house to exercise. It was bad. It was really bad. And at the time my behaviors had me on a really scary and negative trajectory. And it wasn't until I completely lost my period for three years and started fracturing my bones that I was forced to face what was going on and the role that I played in it. I needed to change my relationship with food stat, or I was going to end up in a really, a really dark and unhealthy place. And I don't want to make it sound easy because it wasn't, it took years, but I gradually moved away from diet culture messaging. I stopped tracking my food. I stopped weighing in completely. And I started embracing the all foods fit mentality that I have today. So thanks to therapy, which played a big role in helping me to kind of uncover the root of my eating disorder and continuing education and a lot of internal work, I changed my eating and movement habits from ones that were actually taking away from my health that were harmful to my health to the habits that I have today that help to promote and support my health. And so I felt so passionately about that process and the place that it took me from to where I am today that I devoted to doing the exact same thing for other women. So I teach them how to unsubscribe from diet culture, create healthy eating habits and sustainable fat loss that gives back to their lives more than it takes. I love this so much. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, um, Nicole, but also, I love how you mentioned, you know, you were thought you were, you know, aiding your health journey, but you were actually taking away from your health. And I think that's so important to note. And I want ladies listening who maybe feel like they relate to your story to know that most of the time it's not our fault, right? We There's this diet culture dogma, like you've referenced, where it makes it really confusing as far as what should we be doing to take care of ourselves and our health. And I feel like a lot of times when we hear the word diet or weight loss, we all are, first thing is to make ourselves smaller. We want to make ourselves smaller. And I love how you don't prescribe to that. We talk a ton about debunking diet culture and all of our programming here and just talking about healthy habits and training for life. But I do know there are women out there who are listening. I know you talk to a ton of women. I do too. Who are like, but I do want to lose weight or I need to lose weight for health reasons, not for the point of I want to be a certain size pants or what waistline or whatever. And I feel like weight loss sometimes can almost be like a taboo or sensitive subject to talk about sometimes. So I wanted to get your perspective on how can we really, you know, feel, look, and just perform our best while unsubscribing to that diet culture drama where we're, like you said, counting everything (laughs) that's going in our body and using exercise, not in a healthy way. Yes. I think this is such a great question. And first, I think I need to say that there are two separate camps that I have certainly heard voices from, but I'm sure your listeners have heard as well. One, which is the diet culture camp that says, well, weight loss is always a good thing. The lighter you can weigh, the smaller your body is, the better you are, right? The more worthy you are. And I don't subscribe to that story anymore. I've seen the kind of the darkness behind the curtain, if you will. It's it's not a great place. And then I think there is another camp that says, well, all weight loss, intentional weight loss is a negative thing and it should never be a goal. And I don't really subscribe to that camp either. I understand where they're coming from and why they're rejecting diet culture, Mm -hmm. but I find that I land in the middle and I really believe in body autonomy. I think what you do with your body is completely, you know, your business, but I also have seen working in the health promotion field 
the benefits of living in a body that has less excess body fat to carry. And so if a client comes to me and says, Hey, Nicole, I want to feel better. I want to improve my health markers. I want to, yeah, I want to look, you know, better naked. That's cool too. But I have so many reasons as to why changing my body composition will add quality to my life. Mm -hmm. I want to be the coach in their corner. I don't think diet culture allows us to do that though. And here's why I'm going to answer your question. In order to feel, look, and perform our best, I think the only option is to unsubscribe from diet culture because diet culture only helps us to address one of those things, and that's aesthetics. Diet culture only cares about the external appearance, and my story is the perfect example of that. I mean, I whittled myself down to an emaciated, very sick skeleton, essentially, and I was so unwell. But according to diet culture, I was doing great. I had lost a bunch of weight. I was subscribing to all the food rules, et cetera. And I think that diet culture is messaging, which constantly reinforces eating less and less and less and moving more and more and more. Of course, subscribing to arbitrary food rules. It comes at the cost of feeling like garbage. A lot of the time we lose energy. We lose libido. Oftentimes we lose workout performance because all we care about is eating less and moving more. So I believe strongly that if we want the trifecta, we want to feel fantastic. We want to look hot as hell. And we want to make sure that we're performing our best, whether that looks like setting a PR in the gym or just keeping up with our children and our grandchildren. We have to learn first how to powerfully nourish our bodies. And I believe that looks like eating as much as possible of things that we absolutely love while still creating the results that we want. I love that so much. And same, I feel like I'm in the middle as well when it comes to, you know, living your healthiest self. And I feel like it doesn't, it shouldn't have to be one extreme or the other. And that can be totally customized and personal to you as well. Can we kind of dive a little bit deeper as well? Because I think a lot of folks confused. I know a lot of folks I talk to, they're like, oh, you know, like maybe after a big weight training session, they're like, oh my gosh, the scale went up. And I'm like, you didn't gain fat, you know, it's inflammation, water retention, so on and so forth. Can we kind of talk a little bit, Nicole, about the difference between actual fat loss and weight loss? Yes, please. Because I think this is a really sticky subject for a lot of people. We often just hear the phrase weight loss. That's what, you know, kind of the verbiage that most people utilize. But when we really break it down, weight is basically like our body mass in relation to gravity, right? So we think that what we want is weight loss, but we fail to acknowledge that weight loss can actually be achieved in a lot of different ways, some of which are extremely unhealthy. And that might look like losing fat, but it also might look like losing water weight or muscle or even bone density, bone mass, whereas fat loss is much more specific and it refers to only losing body fat and preserving our muscle mass, preserving our bone density. So while both likely result in the number on the scale decreasing and going down, we want that number to go down because we've lost excess body fat, not things that are essential for our health, for our longevity, for our quality of life. I mean, I don't know about you, but I want to stay independent and upright and mobile for as long as humanly possible. And if we're losing bone density, we're losing muscle. We're actually compromising our ability to do just that. And here's where things get tricky. So let's say I'm after purely weight loss. I just want to see the number on the scale go down, which I think is the trap a lot of us fall into. I'm going to embark on a low calorie crash diet because Hey, quick results, right? That sounds cool. But because I'm significantly under eating, I'm in a really big caloric deficit. I'm probably losing body fat because when I'm in a deficit, that will always be the outcome. But in addition to body fat, because I'm expecting my body to eat so little, I'm also losing muscle mass. Now the scale's going down, right? So that's still an okay thing. Eh, that's where we would be wrong because when the diet fails and it always will, because crash diets are by default unsustainable. I don't want to cut carbs forever. I don't want to eliminate my favorite foods for the rest of my life. So inevitably I go back to eating the way that I was before. Well, then my weight is going to come back to where it was before, but not just that now, because I have less muscle on my frame, I'm going to probably land at a heavier weight than where I started because muscle burns more calories at rest compared to fat. So I want to keep as much muscle in my frame as humanly possible, because if I am losing muscle mass, it's going to be harder for me to lose weight and or maintain weight. Now, the alternative to that is 
taking a slower approach, which does not sound sexy, I totally understand. But if I take a slower, more sustainable approach that makes sure I'm prioritizing the right nutrients, I'm getting enough protein, for example, our muscles need protein. And if I'm perhaps strength training and I'm in a very conservative caloric deficit, so I'm eating less to create fat loss, but not significantly less than what my body needs it's going to be so much easier to maintain the results once I have lost the body fat that I want to lose because I've preserved, and maybe even built some muscle mass. So that's why we can't put all of our, I don't want to say all of our weight, no pun intended, right? But we can't put our entire focus on the scale because the scale is measuring weight and weight is super fickle. I mean, it fluctuates for a ton of different reasons. If you have your period, that number is probably going to be higher. If you had a lot of salt or more carbohydrates than usual, or you drank alcohol recently, you ate out recently, the number is going to be up, but because of water weight. So that's why we can't look at the scale exclusively and say, oh, I'm being successful or I'm being an epic failure because of that one number. And it's why we need to take a closer look at other metrics like clothing fit and health markers and girth measurements and energy level and workout performance in conjunction with the scale, because we may be losing body fat, even though the number on the scale isn't moving a whole lot or not moving as quickly as we wanted to. So in my opinion, weight loss, not necessarily something to celebrate, but fat loss, assuming it's excess body fat is something to get really excited about. Gosh, I hope everyone rewinds and listens to everything you just said after that question, Nicole, because I think that's where a lot of us, and I feel like a lot more light bulbs are going off for women now where it's like, I do need to eat protein. I do need to prioritize strength training. And I don't know if it's just a lot of with my audience, you know, we're starting to see like our mom's age. I'm like my mom and like her mom have arthritis and their bone density is low. And I'm like, mom, we got to lift weights. We got to have protein. And she's just like, I'm just trying trying to lose weight and the scale's going down. I mean, it's just such ingrained in us that the scale is our only measure of success. And when you are, you know, doing the extreme things to lose the weight, it's like a rush. It's like, oh my gosh, look at me go. This is working. I mean, the scale is telling me I'm doing a good thing. But like you said, it's just not sustainable. It is not a habit you can maintain whatsoever. And then it's probably going to take a little bit more work to get your body back to that, you know, homeostasis where it is just a nice level where you can just think about it sustainably long-term. And like you said, that's not sexy, that's not fun, but that's also the most sustainable way. Right. And I love focusing on those non-scale victories for sure. In the most health promoting way. And and I know I'm saying this as though it's what I've always believed. It isn't. I used to be you know, oh, one totally. of those women who was like, Hey, as long as the scale's going down, I'm headed in the right direction. I mean, I would weigh in multiple times a day just to see, Hey, did that run? I just went on make a difference. Mm-hmm. And it honestly wasn't until I was forced to be on a month long bed rest because I had fractured my hip in my twenties mm-hmm. because I had sacrificed muscle. I had sacrificed bone density all for that number on the scale going down. And it's not until I hope many people can kind of work around experiencing a health crisis like that, but it wasn't until I had to face what the consequences of chasing weight loss at any cost was to my health and long-term wellness. I love that. Well, let's, let's talk about fat loss a little bit more. You have a four-step fat loss formula that can be customized. That is like the ideal word there. It can be customized. Can you share a little bit more about that, Nicole? Yes, I would love to. So I call it the four-step diet-free fat loss formula because it's not subscribing to diet culture in terms of believing in food morality. There are good foods you have to eat. There are bad foods you can't eat. You're a good or bad person, depending on what you eat. None of that. We know that that doesn't work. And so I have come up with this four-step formula that of course is individualized client to client to kind of explain that fat loss in theory is rather simple, not easy, but simple. It doesn't need to be overly complicated. There is no perfect diet out there. The one right diet that's gonna work for everybody. We also don't need to get so overwhelmed by all the conflicting nutrition education that's on the internet. Do I eat carbs? Do I not eat carbs? Do I eat meat? Do I not eat meat? Do I eat dairy? Do I not eat dairy? It's much simpler than that. So the four steps are as follows. The first step is to create a conservative caloric deficit that you can see yourself sticking with. 
Now I talked about this a little bit earlier in order to create fat loss, we must be in a deficit. And that means that we're eating less energy. And remember a calorie is simply a unit of energy. So I'm eating fewer calories than my body expends. If I do that, I will create fat loss. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's just how the laws of thermodynamics work. Now I can create a big deficit like cutting out an entire food group, but we know that that's probably not going to work. One, because it's not sustainable. Two, because I'm going to be hungry all the time and nobody wants to be hungry all the time. So that also is likely to be unsustainable. So my approach is let's take a teeny tiny deficit rather than a 500 calorie a day deficit that most diets like to adopt. My clients and I find something around 200 calories to start with. So that's maybe a snack. It's maybe a serving less than what you're currently eating. And we want to make sure that it's done in a way that you can stick with. So if like myself, you love carbohydrates, guess what? We're not going to eliminate carbohydrates. If you love having your ice cream or your pizza Friday night with your kids, we're not going to eliminate that. It has to be done in a way that you feel confident you can continue long-term because that's how we create sustainable fat loss. So first and foremost, we have to create a caloric deficit and that can be done in many, many different ways. Some people like tracking their food. They like seeing what a single serving of protein or fat actually looks like other people don't want to do that at all. And I completely respect that. So maybe that just looks like listening a little bit more closely to hunger and fullness cues. Am I eating because I'm truly hungry or am I eating because I'm bored, stressed, lonely, tired? Am I stopping when I'm satisfied or am I stopping when the plate's clean? Because I grew up in the clean plate club. So lots of different ways we can create a deficit, but that's step number one. Step number two is to prioritize high volume, nutrient dense foods. So what we eat matters. Also how much we eat matters, right? That comes back to calories, but what we eat influences how much we eat. So if, for example, I am eating primarily processed foods, I'm starting my morning with a big bowl of sugary cereal or pop tarts, and then I'm going to grab, you know, a fast food sandwich and a soda, and then I'm going to have some pizza or some pasta or something for dinner. It's going to take a lot of those foods to fill me up because my belly is sort of like a tank, right? And I want to feel satisfied. I don't want to feel hungry. So I need to eat a lot more of those things, which come with a lot of additional calories in order to feel satiated. Whereas if I prioritize high volume foods like fruits and vegetables, whole grains and lean proteins, I'm going to eat much less of that in order to feel exactly the same, if not more satiated. Not to mention these foods come with lots of nutrients, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. So they're leaving me feeling much better than if I were having chocolate milk and a donut every morning for breakfast. Nothing wrong with those choices because again, we're talking about what we do most of the time. Most of the time we want our food choices to be primarily of the earth, whole foods that are really gonna give back to our bodies. And that creates a lot of space for all of those fun foods and beverages that we love too. I'm a huge fan of mint chocolate chip ice cream and will never live my life without it. <laughs> Step number three is to train your brain to see and celebrate progress beyond the scale. So this brings us back to your last question. I work primarily with women and research shows us that women experience more scale fluctuations than men. Because of hormones, because of menstrual cycles, water weight retention, water loss, the scale is one of the biggest ways we can self-sabotage. I'm sure your listeners have experienced trying to lose some weight and maybe they see that number on the scale go down and then their brain goes, oh, I'm being successful. Yay. I've earned a treat. I've earned something. We don't have to earn our food. We earn our food simply by existing, but that's a conversation for another day. I've earned a treat, right? So then maybe we overconsume something because of the number we saw on the scale or the inverse of that might be the number on the scale goes up, even though you feel like you've been super consistent and doing everything right. I'm using air quotes. That's frustrating, right? You've been putting in all this effort. You're not getting the validation. So then maybe subconsciously your brain's like, well, this isn't working. What's the point of even trying? So then perhaps you eat emotionally out of frustration, understandable. So in order to avoid that self-sabotage, I find that my clients and I have to track, I actually require all of my clients to track more than just the scale metric. And I mentioned a lot of those earlier. It depends on what the client's looking for. So whether they're tracking a specific health marker like blood sugar or cholesterol, 
whether they are tracking progress photos or they prefer to do clothing fit or girth measurements, workout perform. There's, there's a ton that we can choose from, but we have to look broader than just the scale. And then last but not least, kind of reiterating this point, I say this word more than any other word, I think is step number four is to ensure sustainability. Because if I can't stick with whatever I'm doing, the results will not stick around either. I think a lot of us just have this false belief that I can diet for a short period of time, create results, and then just go back to real life. But if my behaviors go back to what they were, then my outcomes go back to what they were also. I love these steps so much. So, so much, Nicole, because you made it really simple. You made it super simple. And I like that you mentioned, and I appreciate that you mentioned, it's not easy. You got to really work at this to be like, okay, you know, it's easier to go through the drive-through versus, you know, having a, a small meal prep lunch I made the night before, you know, creating habits of that, which is what we talk about here. It's like, okay, here's the things I need to do. How can I actually do it? And really measuring that success, not by the scale. I like to say the scale is just data. It just tells you where you are. Um, you should never weigh yourself like when your husband is weighing himself too, because he's he'll just be like, oh, I woke up today and lost five pounds. And you're like, ah, so frustrating. And I think a lot of our emotions are tied to this guy. I know I've worked with folks before and they're like, oh, I'm feeling so great. Like they didn't weigh themselves for like 30 days because it was a really like conflicting mindset thing for them. And then they're like, my pants feel good. I feel good. And then they get on the scale and they're like, oh my gosh, I never lost any weight. And it's just going back to that weight loss versus fat loss. And I think the last question I want to ask you, I think, which will tile this up together is, of course, we need to think about ways to habit hack this. And I think the biggest one is mindset. There's a lot of um, things going on in our heads, ingrained diet culture dogma. That's really hard for us to rewire our brains for, right? We get on the scale and we measure our success based off of that. A lot of times we do tie ourselves to being good or bad based on food, or we have habits around emotional eating because- you know, that's just what we do. That's just what we do when we're having these feelings. What are some mindset habits that you could suggest to our audience to help them to no longer subscribe to that diet culture dogma so that the steps you mentioned today can be more sustainable for them? I also want to just mention, so you highlighted how simple the process is, and that's what I love about it. But I also think it's worth mentioning that when my clients and I are working on this process, we do it what we call one action step, but one behavior at a time. So I mentioned there's tons of ways to create a caloric deficit. I would never just blanketly say, hey, go create a caloric deficit, because I think that's absolutely zero help. So what we would focus on is perhaps first identifying that a client isn't eating enough protein, or maybe she struggles eating vegetables. And so we might focus on picking one of those, yes. working on increasing it by a serving a day for a period of time. So very similar to habits, we want to just take a teeny tiny behavior, a 1% better action, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. Yeah. So yes. it's even simpler than what I'm probably making it sound in this podcast overview. But yes, to answer your question, there are so many mindset habits that we could employ, but I'm going to focus on three that I think are super important. So the first one that I think is crucial is rejecting shame as a motivator. So diet culture loves using hate and shame to motivate us to take action. But research shows that trying to create positive change using a negative feeling like shame largely ineffective, does not work, right? And it may work in the short term. So for example, perhaps you've grown up talking to yourself like a bully because that's the model that was set to you. And so in your head, you're constantly like, oh, you're so lazy for skipping your workout. Like, I can't, you need to do better tomorrow. Or like, you're disgusting. Look at yourself. You need to eat better tomorrow. That doesn't work. It might lead to a different choice once or twice, but largely just leaves you feeling like trash. So instead of using shame as the motivator, we want to find our why. So why do I even want to create healthy habits to begin with? Like, why does this matter to me? And how do I want to feel? And thinking about feeling more energized. When I work through my work through a new client intake, I always ask the client to tell me how they want to feel on graduation day. And I make them say it as though that's their current reality. So for example, they might say, I feel 
vibrant and full of energy throughout the day. I can keep up with my kids without feeling like I'm out of breath. I wake up and I don't have to go through three or four outfits to find what I'm going to wear for the day. I feel good in my skin. I feel so healthy. So focusing on the positive things that we want to see and let that be reinforcing to lead to those healthy behaviors rather than to come from that place of shame. The second mindset habit that I would employ is challenging food morality by constantly asking the question, do I know this to be true? And at first you may kind of, you know, play coy with yourself and say, well, yeah, this is true. So then the second follow-up question is, do I know this to be absolutely true? And what I mean by that is many of us have been submerged in diet culture from maybe conception, right? Like we have parents who are maybe chronic dieters. We see it in the media. We ourselves have been subjected to it. And so as we grow up, we have these stories, we have these scripts, we have these beliefs in our heads that we just accept as truth. But I think it's so important to remember that not everything we think and not everything we've heard is actually true. So for example, maybe someone who's struggling with food morality might have a thought that says, oof, I just had that leftover slice of birthday cake on a Tuesday night. I'm so bad for eating this. I can't believe I ate this bad food. This was off limits. Do I know this to be true? Do I know for a fact that birthday cake is bad? Well, no, birthday cake may not be like the most nutritionally dense food, but birthday cake actually tastes pretty good. And I actually really love the icing from this, you know, bakery, whatever it was. And am I eat, am I bad for eating something that I enjoy? No, that doesn't really line up. So logically we can kind of talk ourselves away from this limiting belief that diet culture has kind of deeply ingrained in our brain instead of just believing them as true. So I think every time we feel like a food is good or bad, or I am good or bad for doing or not doing something, eating or not eating something, we've got to question that. Do I know this to be true? Or perhaps am I just stuck in an old story? And then the third mindset habit that I'll share is to protect your peace. And what I mean by that is as humans, we're so easily influenced by our environment. And in our day and age, 2023, that largely includes the voices and the people that we listen to and follow on social media. So if I'm constantly seeing diet culture conditioned messages, and I'm constantly seeing before and after photos where they are touting the thin body to be better and more worthy, regardless of what it took to get there, well, I'm probably going to act and, you know, behave in accordance with those stories, which isn't serving me, right? That's just kind of perpetuating the diet culture message. So I think it's really important to mute, unfollow, screen our social media feeds and just make sure that the voices that we're listening to and maybe the people's lives that we're following along with are supportive of the life that we're trying to build for ourselves rather than that old diet culture messaging that we're trying to unsubscribe from. I think that's so important. And of course, this applies to both on your phone and off your phone. So if you have people in your life who are constantly talking about how they're so bad for eating the muffin and they need to start a diet on Monday, like maybe that's someone you want to have a conversation with or distance yourself from also. But I think Oh, our online environment is just so important. And if we don't protect our peace, we're absolutely going to be influenced by it. Those are so good, Nicole, and just really helping us reframe very intentionally how we feel about food, how we feel about ourselves when we eat food, what is influencing us and just stopping to like have a logical conversation with yourself can really lead you down to a path where it's like, oh, okay. I can do this. I'm overcomplicating it. I'm telling myself a big negative loop and I need to break that loop. And you can do that with some new healthy habits, especially for your mindset. I love it. Exactly. So much. Like a piece of cake is a piece of cake. I would never shame my son for enjoying a piece of cake. So why the heck do I think that I'm right? some special exception? Exactly. Exactly. And on a Tuesday, you're like, well, it would have been okay if it was like a Friday or Saturday, right? We have this loop running in our heads. That's the first thing I thought of too. It was like, oh, why would it would have been okay on a Friday or Saturday. And like, how right. would we want to model to our children? How do we want to model to the people we love around us as well? Like, so let's eat cake. I like it. 
<laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. So Nicole, thank you so much. This is such an important conversation. I hope a lot of ladies today came with open ears, open heart, and had a bunch of aha moments for themselves today as well. Can you tell everyone where they can find out more about you and listen to your show as well? Yes. I just, I thank you so much for having me on the show and allowing me to share my story. I hang out largely on Instagram at nutrition with Nicole. So if anyone has any questions or they want to kind of continue this conversation, shoot me a DM. I am always, always in there responding to questions and comments. I also, if anyone wants to learn more about the four-step diet-free fat loss formula that I was talking about, would love to gift your listeners with a free masterclass and to access that they can just go to nutritioncoachingwithnicole.com backslash diet free masterclass nutritioncoachingwithnicole.com backslash diet free masterclass and that just kind of helps to I know I shared what those four steps were but this actually helps you to apply it in your real life so certainly take advantage of that and yeah the health wealth and wisdom podcast is one of my passions but if you're connected with me on Instagram you'll see me talking about it and posting about it actually Emily our conversation just released today so if your listeners are tuning into this conversation they can go listen to our chat uh, which I believe is episode 226. Oh, good. You're good, girl. You're good. Nicole, thank you so much. We'll make sure to link everything in the show notes. Thank you so much for this gift of this conversation and your time today. We so appreciate you. Thank you so much, Emily. Nicole, thank you so much for this important conversation. Friends, I hope you feel empowered to unsubscribe from diet culture. It doesn't happen overnight, but to really keep a lot of what Nicole told us today in mind when you are trying to create healthy habits, we're not doing it from a place to make ourselves smaller or skinnier, but really from a place of health as well and training for life. So let's talk about our three biggest takeaways from this conversation with Nicole Hagen. There was, there was, there was a lot. It was hard for me to break it down to three, but here's the cliff notes for you. Okay. So number one, you can meet in the middle, middle, you can meet in the middle when it comes to your health. Let me explain. We can unsubscribe from diet culture while still creating healthy habits by focusing on sustainability. Okay. I feel like that's the way you meet in the middle, not quick results. Okay. Okay. You do this crash diet, you get those quick results, but then your diet will fail because it's not sustainable. It is not sustainable to work yourself out to death. It is not sustainable to restrict yourself forever because eventually you'll binge and get really upset that you're not able to enjoy foods that you really love, right? We go back to the way we were before diets because it's just not sustainable. And like Nicole mentioned, we probably gained more since we lost that weight because we lost a lot of muscle mass, right? The more muscle mass, the better because that burns fat. And that's a kind of a way to meet in the middle as well. When you're thinking about healthy habits, we don't want it to be focused on weight loss. We want it to be focused on fat loss, right? Preserving that muscle mass and bone density and not letting it de- decrease because of weight loss. We're, we're, prioritizing strength training, protein, all of the things that Nicole mentioned to us today and being okay that it's not going to be a quick fix. It's going to be slower results and being okay with that. That number on the scale will go down, but just maybe slower with fat loss versus focusing on weight loss. So we can meet in the middle as long as you're focused on what is sustainable for me in this season of life that I'm in. Number two, kind of leading into that is really having a focus on non-scale victories, okay? Focusing on those non-scale victories because like she said, women, (laughs) golly, we, there's so many different factors in our weight. And like Nicole mentioned, (laughs) our weight fluctuates so much more than men. Hence why women have to do habits differently. Like my husband, I'll hear, I'll, he'll weigh himself like after a long run or like simply like just goes poop. And he's like, oh my gosh, I lost all this weight. And it's very triggering for me because then I'm like, oh, well, I'll step on the scale. I'm like, I gained two pounds today. And I was like, I worked out. I ate healthy. I'm drinking my water. Like what is up with that? It's just very triggering for us as women, right? 
But like Nicole mentioned, there's a lot of factors. There's, you know, how much sodium intake. If you had alcohol, carbs, when you get your period or right before you get your period. I know the scale is always up for me. So I want you to focus on looking at non-scale victories. Like Nicole said, in order to feel, look, and perform our best, right? So it's not just about the external appearances. It's more so about my pants fit really well. I have so much more energy. My skin is really clear. I'm sleeping so well at night. My mindset, I am so much more patient with my kids because I am not losing my you know what on them because I'm hangry all the time from being underfed and overtrained, right? So focusing on those non-scale victories, ooh, I think this would be a good tracker inside the shop, right? A non-scale victory tracker. Hang on, I gotta put that in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, my third biggest takeaway was her four-step diet-free fat loss system. I love this. And I think it's really important to mention, you know, she said it's not easy, but it's a simple process, right? It's not easy unsubscribing from diet culture when you have this mentality that has been drilled in your brain for years and you see it on social media, but it is a simple process and it is a way to over to uncomplicate health. So a reminder, those four steps were to create a conservative caloric deficit that you can see yourself sticking with. So she said like 200 calories and that's tiny. She said like, just get rid of like a snack if you're not, if you're not actually hungry, right? Number two, prioritize high volume nutrient dense foods because what we eat matters and influences how much we eat. Like she mentioned, like if I ate a bowl of cereal versus having like eggs in the morning, I'm going to feel a lot more satiated versus like starving later and coming down off that sugar high. Number three, train your brain. So focusing on those non-scale victories and notice that women have to do habits differently. We have to think about our weight differently and that the scale is going to fluctuate more than men. And then just number four, ensure sustainability. Okay. And like she mentioned, this is one behavior at a time. I don't want you to look at this list and be like, okay, I need to, you know, prioritize protein and a caloric deficit. I need like, like all the veggies. I need to meal prep all this. Okay. I need to like write down my non-scale victories every day. Like no, that's not going to help you. Number four and say, ensure sustainability, right? So we talk a lot, and Nicole mentioned this as well, inside of the accelerator program, you hear me talk about it a lot, getting 1% better. 1% better for you, not like I'm going to do like 75% better like all the time. Like, no, it's just that we have so many internal, external distractions as women. We just cannot, we cannot continue to have this all or nothing mentality. It's about starting slow and stacking more on as it is feeling sustainable and as an unconscious habit for you over time, which is what we teach inside of all of my programming. So let's talk about a quick habit hack, a habit loop for you to help you change your mindset around diet culture. And I'm going to use the scale as a habit loop for you. So remember, a habit loop is a cue routine reward. If you do the Healthy Habits Accelerator, my signature program, I actually provide 60 habit loops for you focused around food freedom, mindset, and movement if you need some help figuring that out. And we dig super deep into habit hacking this and actually making it work and inserting it into your actual life. So a cue routine reward. So maybe your cue is you get up in the morning, and I'm going to unsubscribe to diet culture with this habit loop, okay? So maybe your cue is you get up in the morning, you go to the bathroom, your scale is right there next to the toilet. That is your visual cue to then routine, weigh yourself. On the other side, the reward, or maybe not so much reward, is you feel like crap about yourself. Or you feel good about yourself, right? Because you're like, oh my gosh, I lost two pounds overnight and I feel so good, right? It can go either way. And I feel like that's why we keep weighing ourselves, right? Because you're just hoping like fingers crossed praying like, oh, I hope I'm down a couple of pounds because I know it's happened before. That will make me feel good. But that is, if, if that is super triggering for you, let's have it hack a new habit loop for you instead. So your new cue is, we're going to get rid of the scale. It is not going to be visible in your bathroom where you can see it and it's very tempting. Your new cue is maybe on your mirror, you just write in a dry erase marker, affirmation. 
you go to the bathroom, you look in the mirror, your cue is that post-it to say an affirmation, which is your reward or your routine, excuse me. And you say something exciting about your non-scale victory. Like, I feel rested today. I have energy. I am capable. I am patient. So many different ways you can take that affirmation and the reward on the other side is you feel freaking amazing, right? So we have to think about the habit loops we already have in regards to diet culture and think about how we can rework those habit hack, those habit loops in order to unsubscribe from diet culture. Nicole, again, thank you so much for this conversation. Gang, everything is linked in the show notes. So you can go listen to Nicole's podcast as well. Head on over and follow her show. Make sure to leave her a review if you love her episodes, which I know you will. And leave a review here if you love Habit Hack Your Health as well. Gang, I will catch up with you later this week on Habit Hack Thursday. Hey girl, real quick before you go, did you know I have a secret podcast where I talk all about why most habit strategies don't work for us women? Spoiler alert, it's not our fault. (laughs) Visit bit.ly slash Atomic Habits for Women, it's linked in the show notes, to access my secret podcast series and have your biggest aha moment about why and how women have to do habits differently. And if you love the podcast, the number one way you can thank me is to leave a rating and review in iTunes. That way more mamas can find the show. Love and appreciate you, friend. We'll see you next time.